Well, good morning. God is good, isn't he? And all the time? Amen. We serve a good God. But we are continuing our series. This is actually the ninth and last message in the series, Unseen, dealing with the unseen dimension and spiritual battle and uh, warfare. And we've been looking at a number of different aspects of that, and we're going to uh, finish that up tonight, today. But I did want to mention, how many of you have gotten one of these uh, little cards? Okay, they're in, on the table in the back. You'll find them downstairs later as well. Uh, this is a new series of messages. I'll be starting in two weeks uh, in April, a four-part message called Unfathomable Grace. Why God gives grace to those you wouldn't. And uh, it's, it's all on the, based on the story of Jonah. So we're going to be going through that. And uh, that should be uh, an interesting time. I'm really looking forward to it. So keep that in mind. Next week is, of course, Easter. And uh, it's going to be a great time together. Let's uh, look at the passage that we've been focusing on from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 to verse 17. And again, if you would stand as, as we read the word to honor God in his word. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with tr truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you're able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. And this morning we're going to look at the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us understanding in your Word, that you would give us insight, that you would speak to our hearts and open our eyes to see the resources that you have given to us, not only to advance the kingdom of light, but to drive back the kingdom of darkness. So in Jesus' name, I pray that you would help us to see your purpose and your will in this very important subject. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. <clears throat> now I'm excited about this morning's message because up till now, all the different aspects of the armor that we've looked at has been defensive in nature. Uh, shield, st stand there and block the blows of the enemy, um, and the breastplate and the helmet are basically defensive. But today we're going to look at the sword of the spirit, which is an offensive weapon as well as defensive. It parries the thrust of the enemy, but it also can return an attack on the enemy and drive the enemy away. If we're just standing in a defensive posture and blocking all the blows that are coming at us, we may stand firm, but we're not advancing the kingdom. We're not driving the enemy away. And it gets weary some after. Have you ever felt like that in the battle? I just, you know, one guy in the scripture says he was fighting off the enemy from early morning to late afternoon, nonstop. He just kept, the enemy just kept coming, surrounding him, hundreds, maybe thousands, and he's just blocking and protecting himself. And after a while, you get really weary defending yourself. So God says, I'm going to give you something so you can not only defend yourself, but drive the enemy away, drive back the kingdom of darkness. And that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're not left guessing what the 
sword represents, we're told, Peter, uh, Paul says, I want you to know it's the word of God that we're talking about, that is the sword of the spirit. But he further clarifies this word sword by saying it's not just any sword, it's the sword of the spirit. Uh, that this, it's, it's, the word of God is energized by the spirit of God. The word of God is empowered by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. The Word of God is anointed by the Spirit of God. And so we're not just talking about this book. Now, this book is valuable for teaching, instruction, correction, how to live the Christian life, what the Christian life looks like. It's, it's extremely valuable in many ways. But just... We're not just talking about throwing a few verses at the devil. Um, it's not even uh, that you take the sword and say, John 3, 16, <laughs> Matthew 4, 2. <laughs> it's not just verses that were thrown at him. This word is energized. When it's energized by the Spirit of God, when it's empowered by the Spirit of God, when it re reveals the... the uh, the Word of God to us, then it becomes powerful as a tool for, as the enemy, that, um, as the tool against the enemy that we use. So we're going we're gonna to focus on that more. Let me just say a couple, make a couple observations about the sword of the Spirit. I mentioned previously that there are two types of swords that the Romans traditionally used. The broad sword, or the long sword, is about four, four feet long, uh, and so on. This was used mostly by cavalry, or if there was an open area uh, of battle. But in an enclosed area where you uh, are in hand-to-hand -hand combat, all around you people are fighting, but you, you've got one person you're fighting with, then you would use Traditionally, a small round sword atta um, attached to your arm, and you would have the short sword, generally about 18 inches, so you can go into battle, and you, you can't wield this big sword with, with people fighting all around you in very tight hand-to-hand -hand combat type situations. So you use the short, short sword, it's called the Maka Makahira, the Makahira, not the Macarena. <laughs> um, <laughs> if they get, you know, the commander says, get your Makahira, and so they start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would not be very positive in the battle. <laughs> now, you may, you may want to make sure you get the uh, videotape because you're never going to see that again. <laughs> the Makahira. The Makahira was the short sword that tells me it's to be used in times of um, tight hand to hand combat, which refers to those times when you face the enemy alone. The fact is, most of the time, spiritual warfare is something we battle alone. We have our brothers and our sisters to pray for us and to stand with us. And, but in prayer and in worship, we need to take hold of the sword of the Spirit. Not just a couple of Bible verses, but we need to know that the Spirit of God is energizing the Word of God. That the Word of God is being empowered by the Spirit, revealed by the Spirit, and that is called by a whole different term, which we're going to look at more fully in the Word of God. In fact, the word struggle used earlier in verse 12 of chapter 6, it says, we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That word struggle is to wrestle, or the mil military term for hand-to-hand -hand combat. So much of our struggle spiritually in warfare is going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat 
It's going to be times when we wrestle with the enemy and we need the makahira, the sword of the spirit. And the, the other observation I want to make before we look more closely at this, and this is very important, we take up the sword of the Spirit. It's the sword of the Spirit, which means it's the Spirit who gives it, the Spirit who energizes it, the Spirit who wields it. It's the Spirit of God that makes it the sword of the Spirit. I gave you a definition of the sword of the Spirit, what, I, what it means. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God as revealed by the Spirit of God, as empowered by the Spirit of God and applied by the Spirit to my specific situation. So the, the word for word for word, when it says the Word of God is our is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God there uses a word called Rhema word rather than the word Lagos. There are two words for the translated word, the Lagos word and the Rhema word. The Lagos word is the written word. It's the body of truth. Uh, and this is very important to be steeped in and know the Lagos word. But in the middle of a battle, we need God to take that word and ignite it and empower it and to make it um, energized by the power of the Spirit. That's called the rhema word. Rhema word is when God takes the Lagos word, speaks to us in a specific situation, and empowers his word to us. Let me give you two quotes in your, in your notes about the rhema word. So this is very important because we, we confuse. We think knowing the Bible, that's important. But we think knowing the Bible, that if, apart from the work of the Spirit of God, then it will not accomplish the work of God. It will not become the sword of the Spirit. Um, the scribes came to Jesus one time and he said to them, the scribes copied the scriptures. They knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. They memorized the scripture. They loved the scripture, but Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are those which testify of me, so that you would come to me, but you would not come to me for life. The source of life in the word of God comes from Jesus, the word of life comes from the spirit of life. It's as it's empowered by Jesus through the Holy Spirit, the word, the, the Lagos word becomes rhema. Rhema is when God takes that and applies it uniquely in our specific situation. The rhema, W.E. Vine, says the reference of rhema distinct from Lagos is not to the whole Bible as such. The whole Bible as such is Lagos. The rhema is the individual scripture which the Spirit brings to our remembrance for use in the time of need. F.F. F. Bruce, a leading scholar, says the, the word rhema is that utterance from God appropriate to the occasion which, this, this, which the Spirit puts into the believer's hand to be wielded like a sword which will put his assailants to flight. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's rhema. Faith comes from the rhema word of God. Faith comes when God speaks his word to your specific situation. Then you don't have to, you don't have to somehow have faith, conjure up this faith to make it happen. When God speaks the rhema word to your heart, it comes with faith, and it comes by the hearing of the Word of God, by faith. We, we sort of get this backwards, I think. We, we think that I have to have faith, so I have to conjure up something um, 
and make myself believe. And you know, that I've mentioned before, if you have to make yourself believe, it's make believe faith. Um, if you have to make yourself believe. When, when, when the God speaks his word, his rhema word, when God takes the word uh, and unites it to you, it your, applies it to your specific situation, then faith is born with it. And then we confess, which means to say the same. We confess the word that God spoke to us, but it presupposes that God spoke his rhema word to us, and when he speaks, his, it comes with power, and it comes with anointing, and it comes with faith. Faith is born in that. And so the sword of the Spirit is when the word of God is spirit revealed, spirit anointed, spirit empowered, spirit energized. Um, all of you have had situations, I'm sure, where uh, God has where God has given you a word in a situation which has changed everything about the situation. We uh one of my daughters, when she was five years old, had developed uh, cellulitis. This was 20 years ago. Cellulitis was unknown at that time. There's only been a few documented cases, and nobody knew what was wrong. She just kept getting sicker and sicker, and she couldn't move her neck. She was in excruciating pain. They finally put her in the hospital, and she was in terrible pain and getting worse and worse. And... Uh, to the point where we didn't know if she would make it. She was in her neck. Uh, if it spread upward, it would go into the brain. If it spread downward, it would go into the spine. And uh, so we, we didn't know what it was, how to treat it. We later found out about children who have died from it. And uh, one, one night, 3 o'clock in the morning, I was in the hospital. sitting next to my daughter who was fitfully waking and sleeping. And uh, Janet was with the, we had a number of young ones as well. And I'm sitting there and my daughter, before she fell off to sleep, said, Daddy, do something. Daddy, make me feel better. And I was, I was a pastor. I'm supposed to know about faith. I teach on faith. I encourage people to have faith. I pray for people to have faith. And I, I said, said to God, God, what? I've taught on the subject of faith, but now I'm at a situation where I don't feel like I understand anything about faith. And uh, so I was just praying uh, that God would do something and uh, God gave me a verse, which is not normally, <clears throat> would normally be associated with having great faith. I was sitting there saying, God, what, what, what do I have to do? What, what should I do? And he gave me the, the story of the father who brought his son to Jesus and said, can, can you do anything to help him? Jesus said, can you? He said, what do you mean? He said, well, all things are possible if you believe. He said, that's the problem. I, I, don't, I don't believe. Yet I do believe. He said, Lord, I, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And I said, I could do that. I, I could do that. So, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And that became, then I was at peace with God and 
fell asleep, and the next day she perked up some, and then the, the next day they said, we think we know what she has. It's only, we've only, we only, only discovered it or called it by name just recently, something called cellulitis. And uh, they gave her the most powerful antibiotics they had, and, and within a couple of days, she had recovered. And uh, I thought, usually it's in situations that are more desperate that we need to hear a word from God. And that's a rhema word. It's when, when faith comes by hearing the, the word of God, and God can speak that kind of word to us. That's the sword of the Spirit. The, you know, read the word, study the word, learn all about the word, let it shape your life. But when it comes to spiritual warfare, many times you need the word of God spoken by the Spirit of God and empowered by the Spirit of God. And uh, if I gave you opportunity, I'm sure many of you could uh, share illustrations of that. And when God speaks to your heart, then when, when he, he speaks it, then you can speak it. Many times we try to speak it before God has spoken it to us. And uh, so let me give you some of the characteristics of the sword of the Spirit. And we find in Hebrews chapter 4, a number of them, beginning of verse 12, it's in your notes, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the vision of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There is no creature hidden from, the, from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Sharper than any two-edged sword, what does that mean? Two-edged sword means it cuts both ways. You use it against your enemy. God takes it and uses it as a surgeon's scalpel in our own life. When we use the sword against the enemy, it cuts deeply into our life, judging, discerning, piercing, exposing the areas of our life that need his healing. So the first thing he says is, the Word of God is living and active. It's living and active. Living means not only does it contain life, it has the power to give life. The Word of God has the power to give life. Not just the words, which are ink on paper, but when those words are spirit-revealed, Spirit-empowered and Spirit-applied. Jesus said in John 6, 6, 63, It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh is the natural mind and natural strength. The words I have spoken to you, they are Spirit and they are life. And so they change and transform us. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, he has made us servants of the new covenant. Not of the letter of the, the word, but of the spirit of the word. For the letter of the word kills, but the spirit gives life. The word of God is alive. It imparts life. The word of God is also active. It transforms our life. It has the transforming power of God. The word that God, uh, that gave us life is the word that can enable us to live that life. How many of you know the, the thing that separates the Bible, the word of God, from every other book that's ever been written is that there are many books that can tell you how to live, how you ought to live, what you ought to do. 
but they can't give you the power to do it. Go to Barnes & Noble and buy every book on dieting. And they'll all tell you, this is what you do to lose weight. <laughs> but they don't give you the power to do that. I look at these exercise commercials, and I, th I think to myself, in just 30 days, <laughs> 30 minutes a day, five days a week, in 30 days, I can look like this guy. <laughs> it may take me 20 days. I don't <laughs> but I'm going the wrong direction, and uh, the, the sad truth is, that's true, that's true, it's accurate. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, 30 days, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, uh, I would look buff, I'd be, I'd be there. <laughs> but uh, but it doesn't, that book doesn't give me the power, that commercial doesn't give me the power to do that. And I say I'm gonna do it and I, <laughs> I need a, a book that can energize me and empower me to do what it exhorts me to do. That's what the Spirit of God does with the Word of God. They can give you principles for living, but they can't give you the power for living. But God's Word is transforming and can transform our life. The Word of God, number two, is piercing and precise. So God can take the general word of God and make it precise in your life. Like a knife of a surgeon, it can penetrate to the marrow of the bone, which is the innermost part of our of physical being. God's word is precise, accurate, discerning, discriminating, and he can apply that in his wisdom to our life. The word of God also exposes and discerns. Exposes and discerns. It exposes the real motives of our heart, discerns what is soulish from what is spiritual. And if we will expose ourselves to the word of God, it will discern those areas of unbelief and hardness of heart that keep us from fully uh, living in a relationship with God. So the word of God is living and active. It's, pre it's precise, it's piercing. Word of God discerns, exposes. But there's another aspect that I want to wrap up this series with. Some even include it as the seventh uh, piece of armor. And Larry alluded to it earlier, actually. Verse 18 is praying in the Spirit. And we need to pray. Everything, everything that I've said about the spiritual armor needs to be saturated and bathed in prayer and worship, which is a form of prayer. So look at verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 6. And I just want to make a few comments because much of spiritual warfare is on our knees. It's in prayer or in worship to God. And it starts with the word and, connecting it to what he just said. He said, put on all the armor and pray in the, in the spirit on how many occasions? All. all occasions. With how many kinds of prayer? All, all kinds of prayer and requests. Be alert and how often do you keep praying? Always. Always. Keep on praying for how many saints? All. For all the saints. He's, he's saying pray all the time. Pray all kinds of prayers. Pray for everybody. Because prayer in the spirit, not just praying that's born out of the natural mind and natural will and natural emotion, those are important, but there's a tapping into the spirit of God that we need, need to take place. Pray in the spirit on all occasions. Pray by means of the spirit. Pray dependent upon the spirit. Pray directed by the Spirit. Pray born by, uh, born by the, the Spirit. Pray empowered by the Spirit. Let me mention four things, and we'll wrap it up with that. 
Number one, praying in the Spirit is an attitude of continual, humble dependence upon the Spirit as evidenced by making, by the priority of prayer in my life. Pray at all times, in all seasons, on all occasions, all kinds of prayers, in all places, for all people. In other words, prayer is not a last resort. Prayer is a first course of action. Amen. Then it's not like, oh, the situation is so bad, we, we have to pray about it. John Bunyan said, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can do no more than pray until you've prayed. Amen. Prayer is, the priority of prayer is, indicates our dependence upon God. I am motivated to pray when I honestly believe that God is the sole source of everything I need for life and godliness. And it's only humble dependence upon the Spirit of God that through which I can appropriate the provision of God. Number two, praying in the Spirit is discovering God's will and getting in on what God's doing rather than trying to bend God to our will and get him to support what we're doing. Isn't that what we usually do? I hear people talk about answered prayer. How do you get your prayers answered? I, I personally think God always answers our prayer. He just doesn't always answer it the way we want him to. Sometimes he answers, he answers it yes the way we want to, him to. Sometimes he answers no. Uh, and I was telling somebody just this morning, God's no means nothing but the best. No is just short for nothing but the best. If we get a no now, well, God's got something better. But sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, sometimes he says not yet. But when we talk about answered prayer, we usually mean, uh, I read articles, books that say how, how, to have, how to get God to answer your prayers. Presumably because he doesn't want to answer our prayers. So we, we, we've got the techniques and the formulas that will enable you to do that. How to pray to get results. Prayer that works. So obviously the prayer is not working, so we've got to do, figure out what's going to make it work. How to get God on your side. Six answers to six keys to answered prayer. Arthur Pink said, "Prayer is diligently observing the providential motions of God. Much of prayer is seeking to discern what God is doing, and then we get in on what, what He's doing. Because I can assure you, God blesses what He's doing. Never, if you're doing what God's doing, you get in on what God's doing." then you don't have to worry about whether he's going to bless it or not. He'll bless it. Number three, praying in the Spirit is presenting ourselves to God so that he can change us rather than trying to get God to change our circumstances. Oswald Chambers said, we, we say that prayer changes things, and prayer does change things. But sometimes we need to understand that prayer changes us. And in the, 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 the work of the Spirit through changing us, God then can use us and, and call us to change our circumstances. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but by, in everything by prayer, with supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all under comprehension, to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God invites us to cast our cares upon him, to bring all of our needs and our wants to him. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, will guard your heart and mind. We usually think, well, I won't get peace in this anxiety-producing circumstance unless God takes it away and delivers me from it. Then I'll have peace. God says, no, I got a, a peace that passes understanding that you, is beyond understanding. I can understand a peace 
that comes when God takes away the anxiety-producing circumstance. But he says, I'll, I'll give you a peace that you can't understand. It's a peace in the midst of your anxiety-producing circumstances. And you're going to find God's peace in that situation. Say, so, do you have any peace that I can't understand? <laughs> the one that passes understanding is not what I was looking for. We normally think of peace as being the result of God answering our prayer in the way that we want. God says, I'll give you a peace in the midst of that circumstance. And number four, praying in the Spirit is empowerment by the Spirit to face and deal with my difficult and painful circumstances. It's not a magic fairy dust that makes all my problems go away. So we want to have some fairy dust I can sprinkle on my problems and they'll go away. Or uh, a lamp that I can rub and Genie Jesus gives me three wishes <laughs> and uh, tells me, what's your wish is my command? And we want a God like that. But he empowers us by the Spirit to face and do his will in the midst of that. Now, God, God can change circumstances, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying don't pray that God changes circumstances, uh, but understand God wants to change us and very often make us the conduit through whom his power can be released. I'll close with this. How many have ever heard of the expression, let, let go and let God? Just let go and let God. People used to tell me that. I said, well, what, what do I let go of and what do I let God do? What, was, what does that mean? <laughs> if you mean let go of your striving and your need to be general manager of the universe and let God be God, then I would agree with that. If, you're, if you mean... Let go of your responsibilities and let God have them and just give them to him and say, so, okay, they're yours now. You worry about them. Uh, no, we give them to him so he can direct us. Uh, and not because he says, okay, I'll take care of all those problems. You know. He says, well, look, here's a problem, but here's how I've got you involved in being the answer to that problem. So... All of that to say, God has given to us a spirit, um, a sword of the spirit, that he will energize the word of God for us. He will empower it. He will reveal it. He will anoint it. And he will cause us to be victorious in the battle he's, that we face. Amen? Amen. 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 If the... If the uh, worship team would come. And I agree that many times God uses the worship of his people. In the Old Testament, he would send the Levites ahead and they would worship. They had no weapons other than worship. But in the worship of God's people, the enemy would be routed. God would step in and empower their worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your faithfulness. And we've covered a lot of material. We pray that you would remind us in all of this that you are the source of all that we need in all that we face. So we give you thanks, enable us, empower us with your word so that Jesus would be exalted. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.
I love God. I really do. I love the Lord.